Welcome to M&A Science Live, where leading M&A practitioners share lessons learned from their experience. When you use proven techniques in M&A, M&A, more value is created. If you're interested in keeping up with the latest from M&A Science, visit mascience.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Again, that's mascience.com. I'm your host, Kisan Patel, CEO and founder of M&A Science and Deal Room. Today, I'm here with Jay Detling, CEO of Ansira. As CEO of Ansira, an independent global marketing technology and services firm, Jay is responsible for growing the agency's business, building their client roster, developing and attracting talent, and expanding Ansira's capabilities. With more than 20 years of experience, Jay's areas of expertise include digital marketing, market growth acceleration, technology partnerships, client service, and employee advocacy. How are you doing, AJ? Hey, Kisan. Thank you very much for having me on your show. My pleasure. Can we kick things off with telling us a little bit about your M&A background? Yeah, great. Uh, that sounds like a great logical place to start. So um, as you mentioned, you did a great job on the intro too. I might, uh, might pull you in to help me on some other situations. But um, yeah, my, my M&A background started a, a couple stops ago. I won't uh, you know, kind of go through every one of those stops, but I had the fortunate pleasure with some of my business partners of growing a digital agency here in the North America. And through the later stages of that, we had taken that organization public. It was called Acuity Group and had taken it public. And so that afforded us an opportunity to start looking at other organizations where we could acquire. So really started to you know, cut my teeth, I guess I'll use that phrase on how do you evaluate uh, organizations? And it's not just the revenue and their solution offering, it's all of the, the nuances uh, that you really kind of unpack. And, and from there, uh, accelerated, you know, my uh, my my teeth cutting, if you will. I was acquired. I was acquired by Accenture, and uh, and then integrated the the firm I mentioned, Acuity Group, into Accenture. And it was part of a very aggressive acquisition spree that Accenture, you know, really started before us, but really accelerated after us. And so that afforded me another experience, which was actually working from the inside at a really large, well-run organization like Accenture to look at our entities and help, you know, kind of guide both the, uh, the the executive team as well as the executive team of the acquire the, the, the acquisition and uh, folks at Accenture in terms of the merits and pros and cons and how to step through that process because it, it is a tricky process. And then from there, I had the uh, fortunate pleasure of moving on to Adobe, another high growth organization and was involved in several acquisitions there. Um, and then that brought me to Ansara where I am today, as you mentioned, and we are currently integrating two acquisitions today. So I think, you know, I'm in an always learning mode and hopefully, you know, leveraging some of the learnings from the past to just refine the approach going forward. I like even immersed on both sides of the table. And I think that's makes it really unique and hoping to get some unique lessons out of that too today. Yeah. Yeah. Ho- hope to share some. So with your experience of being acquired effectively, how do you preserve value while you're being acquired? Yeah, that uh, it's a great question. And, it, you know, it's a, and there's not a playbook always uh, to share, but uh uh, there was a gentleman I'll reference, actually, Beiju Shah at Accenture. I, I believe he's head of strategy now for Accenture Interactive, a really, really uh, bright mind. And I had the fortunate pleasure of working with him. When I was being acquired, he pulled me aside at one point. I was the president of the entity acuity group being acquired. And he could tell that we were you know, starting to struggle with, oh, my gosh, how is this going to work? And, um, you know, a million micro decisions. And how do you do this? And his advice was, you know, you really have to step back and think about what is the ethos of your organization? What is your manifesto? And, and really at the essence of that is what do you stand for? What, what is really important that, you know, you really want to protect and preserve? And what are the some of the other things that you can sort of let, uh, you know, kind of disintegrate, I guess, is a, is a better term, because it's really um, what's challenging. That's that's the piece of advice. And what's challenging about putting that in practice, especially for founder uh, led organizations um, or organizations that have been led by people for many, many years is you've toiled for so long and through a lot of arduous times to build that entity. And there's a lot of pride in that, everything from end to end. And you're proud of that whole thing. And so it's difficult to say which thing you want to die on the hill for versus another thing you might be like, I don't really don't, you know, have a big, you know, stake in that decision going left or right. And so that was really good advice. And I, I would pass it on to anyone is step back, take a white, you know, clean sheet of paper. And think about, you know, what what you really want to protect. And, and, you know, you do have to be prepared to probably relinquish some of those things, but what, but really know what your high priority elements are. What are the things that are part of your manifesto or ethos? Well, geez, at, at that time, you know, it was a different time. Uh, 
But I remember being surprised by it. I wouldn't have said it. Um, and this is just a point in time. So I'm not saying this applies to everybody, but I did learn, you know, how to separate um, what I'll call the brand, the office, which is a geographic outpost of people, right? And the community. And, you know, for most organizations, that's one thing, especially if you're a single location organization, it's even tighter. If you're decentralized, you know, meaning you have kind of a franchise model, a lot of different outposts, it, uh, you know, they're, they're all the same. But at, at that particular instance, it was all three of those things were one thing. And we really, you know, had to step back and think about what is most important. And, um, you know, what probably goes away pretty quickly is your brand. You know, there's some equity in it, but I, in most acquisitions, it feels like it's 12 months or less. So you should be prepared for that. And then your location um, gets in, intermingled, if you will, or, you know, integrated in some way. You have new people showing up and some of your people, if you want to call them your people, are going to other locations. So you kind of lose control of that four boundaries. It's like a parent watching your kids, you know, move out of the house. And, you know, what's most important is that community because everyone wants to, you know, I think it's a natural human condition. You want to belong to a community. So you have to really think about, okay, if we're changing our community boundaries because they're not bounded by that brand or this geographic location, how do we, how do we, you know, create that, 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 uh, that community that sticks and that means something. Yeah. It's interesting how you describe them. And I, I see how these could fluctuate per deal, per company. Mm -hmm. How does this get communicated? And is that, is the goal to get this alignment on both sides and saying, Hey, these, these are sort of the things that are important for us and what we're trying to preserve and keep a focus on it. So they don't I think, it. yeah, I think for astute, um, transactions, cause I'll, tr I'll try to compliment both sides for the acquirer and the acquisition. If they've been through that, or maybe they have some counsel helping them. If they've been through that before, they will talk about those things up front. What I have found, however, in practice is they're not spoken about, uh, enough. You know, there's a lot of focus on, the natural things you, you run to, okay, what's the revenue? What's the EBITDA? What's the pipeline? Uh, what's the new capability? What are the case studies? Because those are all the, you know, those are just the four or five things that you run to right away. And the hard part is what are the, you know, those, those, those elements that are really critical for the acquisition candidate? And then how do we, you know, if I take the position of an acquirer, how do we feel about that? Is that going to cause ripples? Is that something we work with? Is that going to cause more work, less work? Is that going to be additive? So I think what happens is a lot of those things are actually talked about after the deal is consummated uh, and not enough before, uh, you know, just in my, my um, you know, various uh, uh, practices or, or experiences. Okay. So this should be talked about early in the deal process. And I, in talking about it early, both sides essentially get aligned around it. And, and I guess, does this differ? Because a lot of people reference value drivers in a deal, mm -hmm. right? And it sounds, this doesn't sound exactly like that. This sounds a little bit more of within the company and the people, sort of how they, you know, as an organization, what they value. Yeah, I'd say it's, it's a little bit more nuanced. Value drivers are, um, you know, kind of uh, the classic management consulting points of synergy or some such thing mm -hmm. that are part of the business case. And and they're, they're super important. You need those. Um, what I'm talking about maybe are strategic guideposts. They're more nuanced. Um, and, uh, you know, I think I think the other thing that's really interesting about that, if you were to, you know, if I were to grab an acquisition anywhere in my history or, you know, out in the marketplace and, and an acquisition that is about to be acquired, being acquired or was acquired, and you grab four executives from that entity, they might not all agree because it's not something they're walking around with you know, on their piece of paper that they're all, you know, high-fiving before they go out of the office every day or something like that, like a locker room or something. It's, it's, it's something that, especially when you're building a company and operating it, it's kind of the, the aura of the company. Sometimes part of it's written down, some of it's written down, some of it's kind of be the feel. It might be how they approach their customers. It might be how they approach recruits. It might be how they deliver their service or product. And sometimes it's very tangible. Sometimes it's intangible. So, I think that's the other thing that's really interesting about it. And, and my, my very strong recommendation for any acquisition, you know, leading up to that process, take a moment with your management team and write those things down, you know, take, spend the time kind of rallying and getting that alignment. So you feel like you really know what you want to stand for, what you want to, you know, maybe fight for uh, in the, in the discussions beforehand. Uh, and when afterwards is difficult because you have a lot of things coming at you. 
um, you know, including job opportunities for some of the people that were in your inner core and they're moving out of the, the nest, if you will. So it just things get a lot more, um, uh, you know, dynamic, I'd say, after the acquisition happens. It sounds like a, some of the elements you're talking about really relate to culture, but some of the things are almost a, a bit outside of that, too, when you gave examples of the brand and, and things of that sort. So it's 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 interesting how you describe it. And it's um, a little unique when I when the typical interviews I have. <clears throat> yeah, I think that's Kisan. That's a really um, uh, astute observation, frankly, because it's not just culture. It could be how you operate you know, how you come together, how you bring multiple di disciplines together to deliver, a, you know, a service for a client. It, it could be, um, you know, the way you you uh, host town halls. I mean, something as specific as that. It could be the way your uh, laptops are deployed to your teams and the, you know, the kinds of laptops, the kinds of equipment you outfit your, your people with. It could be, <clears throat> you know, the way you structure the work week. Do you have periods where, you know, there are no meetings and, you know, you can't have meetings. So it's creative space for people to think. I mean, it's the, the whole gamut and all of those things do play into the culture or what I would say is the ethos of an organization. Got it. How about integration? How do you create value in integration? <clears throat> wow. That's a, that's a big question. We need a whole podcast for that a whole second one, but <laughs> yeah, the, the um, I mean, that's what everyone's looking for. You know, it's, uh, you, it's, it's a cliche phrase, but it really, you know, it's really uh, visceral for me. You want one plus one to be three. You know, it, if you take uh, two organizations and just take their revenue and add them together, um, that's interesting and that's that's good. But uh, maybe somebody's trying to make a quarter so they make an acquisition. But you really you're really looking for one plus one equals three or what I would call an accelerant. And and I've seen a lot of situations, as, as you mentioned, uh, you know, I've kind of been through a few trials and tribulations from multiple sides of the, the conversation. And. I, you know, I've, I've tested this theory because I'm always kind of trying to like, you know, prove it wrong. And, and my experiences haven't proven it wrong, frankly. It, I believe, you know, when it comes to integration that you want to get, uh, uh, you know, and you want value creation, of course, so that's the one plus one equals three, that you want to get through the integration phase as fast as you can. Because on the other side of that, it, you know, it's not always a holy grail, but that's the value creation phase. And, and, you know, to put it more succinctly, sometimes, um, you know, acquisitions are made and you'll, you'll recognize that, wow, we're going to invoke a lot of change on this acquisition and that's going to disrupt the mojo and the, the momentum they have in the market and the way they deliver. And gosh, if we do that, the business case will be rocked. So let's, let's just let them off the side and let them do their thing and we'll continue to do our thing. What ultimately happens is you confuse a lot of people in both organizations about are we supposed to work together? Are we complement? Are we are we talking, not talking? And that permeates through thousands of decisions every day. And you're just, you're delaying the value creation. And so it's much better, in my opinion, to make some hard decisions. And you might bump into some walls, you might break some things, but the sooner you break them, you can move on and fix them and get to the value creation phase. And I, I just think you remove so much ambiguity for both organizations and you get get on with it, so to speak, because it's inevitable anyway. So I, I, I'm a big proponent of uh, getting through the integration phase as fast as you can. And fast is, is a, you know, I guess a subjective you know, term. Fast could be 12 months. Fast could be three months. Fast could be 30 days. Um, so just, you know, it, it, but, but acknowledge that we want to move fast through it and, and, you know, uh, make the best, best decisions we can with the information that we have today versus being paralyzed and saying, well, I'm, you know, too risk averse. I don't want to make that. I think you, you know, in most cases you want to move fast. So in your view, integration essentially is this period where you got to combine systems and really do a lot of these tactical task to get the entities structured together. And then after that is when teams are essentially focused on more of the value creation activities, which tie in back to the, the investment thesis of why we bought the company to begin with. Yeah, I would probably, um, if I could, I would probably separate maybe uh, back office activities of integration, you know, whether it's finance systems or ERP uh, from things that are more value creation, which is, um, you know, how you go to market to, uh, together and how you deliver for clients together. Those are the most important things. And so they're certainly aided by the back office things, but I would figure out those, those, those things first and then let the back office things take the time that they need to. And, and, and it's a very real uh, point that you raised, Kisan, because 
the back office things, you know, like for example, in a services business, if you take two organizations and you're trying to staff and you're on two different systems of record as to who's available and who's uh, allocated, that becomes very clumsy. You can say, hey, we're all in one master system and we, you know, take put the best athlete or the best person on the engagement, you know, that's qualified and so forth. But if you have two systems, it really slows you down. So you do need the back office to integrate. But I think deciding how you how you will work, uh, come together to deliver for clients is is uh, paramount. Uh, otherwise, you have teams sometimes competing. You know, I've seen situations where I've been into organizations and we've acquired things, and it's like a Venn diagram. There's a slight overlap with you know uh, the 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 acquirer uh, with that acquisition. And if you keep them separate, it just creates animosity in the marketplace. And oh my gosh, you're on the same team. What what are we doing here, folks? You know, right. it becomes one of those moments. So would you look at the go to market part, combining the those uh, sales teams together, and part of integration and then still looking at the post activities after that as value creation or is that starting to well i'd look at both of the things can contribute to value creation for sure for sure but i just i wouldn't um integration to me i guess i was trying to make the distinction it's not just plugging it systems together or the finance systems it's um you know some of those other things that are that are a little bit more indirect uh first that aren't really system related you know in terms of what is our, uh, you know, what is our product uh, list? What is our product master? What is our offering? Uh, you know, who, who are our teams? How do we staff? You know, is it all one pool? And we're kind of working from the same playbook. Got it. So I guess if you were putting your words and separating the two between here's integration activities and then the value creation, because it sounds like. Oh, mm-hmm. th- yeah, because that's what you mentioned. I, I didn't know if there's here's two, di- two distinct stages when you sort of focused on the playbook we created to execute integration activities versus the stuff that's more directed towards actual value creation. Yeah. L- let me give you an example that maybe will, will bring this to bear. So, um, you know, if, if you, if there's an acquisition scenario and the companies aren't integrated, they, and this is just one scenario, there's probably a thousand permutations of this, but if they're not integrated, what they may have are two different uh, sales reps calling on the same company, talking about their product set, in the same, I'll be a little uh, direct here, myopic way that they were before the acquisition. And if you integrate and, and, and get to the value creation phase, when you're talking about those two distinct products, it might create a much larger opportunity, not just one plus one equals two. So instead of two fifty thousand dollar opportunities, you have a hundred, it might actually create a much more grandiose project or um, unlock something that you couldn't unlock before. So all of a sudden you have a 300,000, 3 million, 300 million, whatever the scale is opportunity, because you're, you're representing a full suite of capabilities uh, as opposed to two individual silos. And that's a very extreme way to kind of represent it, but that's, that's maybe a a framework to think about. I got it. So essentially the value creation is the end result of the integration. And that's why you want to get through the integration sooner than later. You talked about decision-making. You got to make hard decisions. You got to make the best decisions. You got to make fast decisions. Talk to me about that. How, how do you get leaders? I, one, I think uh, this is the the probably the challenging part I've heard is you start thinking about decisions from the top level of management, but then as you go through integration, there's additional layers and additional many decisions that need to get made. How do you get alignment around the thinking of making decisions? throughout the organization uh, to continue an integration to keep that momentum going? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, what, what's cut through it, because uh, there's a lot of different um, ways to think about it. I guess two things stand out for me, Kisan, just from, from experience. I think first and foremost, um, and it does sound a little classic, but I think it, it's important, is understanding when an acquisition is made, what is the business case? What are we, and, and that should inform us as to what are we trying to achieve? Not just the qualitative words, but the financial goals and how are we measuring those goals? Because those, you know, when you come to forks in the road and you're trying to figure out in an ambiguous ambiguous situation many times, do we go right or do we go left? Knowing how you're uh, proceeding towards achieving that business case of financial outcomes and, and certainly paying attention to some of the qualitative ones as well, but the, the quantitative ones kind of uh, allow you to, um, to 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 make those decisions. I think you know that that's first and foremost uh, that I found very very important in terms of how are we measuring it as opposed to, well we know they did this amount of revenue and we we expect them to grow because they have an operating plan. Well, what is the business case? Because sometimes you may have to um, give to get 
You know what I mean? And and what I mean by that is, uh, you know, the the acquiring company may have gone after an opportunity a certain way, and now that they have this new acquisition, they may pull back. It may make more sense to pull back and let the acquisition lead. And uh, since we, you know, numbers kind of make this real, instead of selling the million dollar deal, maybe start with the acquisition who sells a two hundred fifty thousand dollar deal because that'll unlock a two million dollar deal behind it. As an example, you have to have some trust and faith in those kind of scenarios, but I think knowing that you have a business case you're driving towards helps kind of uh, drive some decisions. The second thing I would say is it's very important um, to kind of play out some some decision cycles and, and test, you know, before you actually get into the into the the wild. Because I've seen so many situations where there's like a PMO organization that's very methodical about you know setting things up, you know, getting domain names registered, getting people on email, all those really important things that you sort of take for granted, uh, maybe unfortunately, uh, in some cases, they, they're they really good at that. And I've seen high, high uh, you know, performance acquiring companies have those PMOs. And oftentimes what happens is they get through that and, you know, they run away to the next acquisition and, and the business operators are like, yeah, so now what? How do we, who's, who's doing what? What authority? Did we lose our authority? Do we have to check? I, I don't even know what I'm doing. Should I just do what I was doing before? And so what I think is really important is establishing you know, sort of what's the governance cadence, you know, what's the span of control, what's the authority so that, you know, it's predictable. I think one of the, um, uh, you know, elements that also reduces is, you know, what we call FUD, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. When you're an acquisition, um, there are a lot of times that FUD just enters into your psyche because you just, it's the unknown. And um, if you're the acquirer, that's the last thing you want to have happen. You, You see this valuable team, this executive team, this operating team, you want to give them all the gasoline so they can go. And uh, so I think it's important to kind of think through the lines of uh, the governance and the uh, lines of uh, authority and just pressure test. You're not going to think of everything in advance, but try to think of those decisions and how they would be taken so that uh, people can move fast and they feel very empowered, uh, which I think is another important phrase to to think about. I have clear, clear governments and uh, a business case that can be referenced for doing the deal. Mm-hmm. The FUD stuff is real. Like that's, probably one of the biggest things to to overcome is there's an approach around that (laughs) yeah let's see well the um it's a great question uh you're asking a lot of good questions obviously um yeah i think um you know the approach i would go with i was just trying to reflect upon a couple situations they're so bespoke but i i think what uh what you have to develop are two things you have to develop trust you know, uh, at, at levels in the organization, because that helps you know, break down FUD. And then you have to attack it with a lot of communication. And I don't think I've run into from any, you know, perspective I've had uh, the fortunate experience of having, I don't think I've ever seen a situation where somebody or I've said, you know, there's just too much communication. Wow. I wish <laughs> they'd slow it down. You know, sometimes as the as a team trying to formulate the communication, it's a lot of work and, and you know, it's a thankless, uh, thankless role sometimes. But um, you can't have enough communication. You cannot have enough. I would say that is very, very important. It sounds like the best approach is essentially to try to over communicate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, again, there are situations for the acquirer. Uh, you know, I've, I've probably taken the perspective of the the acquisition and a lot of the, the answers that I've given you. but you know, as an acquiring entity, uh, that doesn't give you omniscient status where you have all the answers um, either. And sometimes, you know, I found people um, uh, reticent to communicate because they just don't know. I think when you don't know, um, give your best answer or say you don't know, because that's, you know, being vulnerable is not a bad thing either. And it does ingratiate you with the acquisition in many ways. Yeah, that's very- You know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. It sort of triggered uh, this, this story for me. And you know, I'll protect the the the, the nameless just because it, you know it probably wouldn't be good for me or the anyway. But <laughs> I, I remember, you know, um, I, w- I was uh, fortunate to sit with a few acquisitions in one of these stops, and um, and we were you know doing some onboarding together with uh, the acquiring leadership team, and we were talking about you know what's going well, what's not going well, and I just I just remember having just a just hearty belly laugh to uh, the situation because the acquiring entity couldn't have been more gracious and hands-on and thoughtful and, and full of empathy and, and 
um, really, you know, caring for the people and, and there are people involved in this. And then, you know, what was the dichotomy of the situation was then you get these draconian emails that had no caring and no sensitivity and, you know, things like your time report is late and you didn't even know what the deadline was. And it was like, you know, it felt like you were going to get fired in five minutes and it was complete 180 from the, the feel that you had from the people side. And so that happens sometimes, you know, and that's over communicating, but it, you know, that happens and it's, you fall into as the acquirer, you have to be wary of these unintended consequences or unintended scenarios that, you know, it's funny to laugh at now, but you never would have thought of that. You know, things like that could set off a whole team uh, to be like turned off. Like, wait, we were acquired by these guys and, you know, they don't, they don't really get us. And look at this email. It couldn't have been more draconian and like, you know, robotic and less, you know, lacking empathy and so on and so forth. But Anyway, the, just you, you know, just like we, when we're working with our clients, whether you're a technology company or you know a services-based company, you're always thinking about you know customer interaction from a 360 perspective. The same thing when when you're an acquirer acquiring an acquisition, it's important to think about well, how does our finance team face off? How does our HR? How does our you know uh, operational team? You know, how are they treat? How do our salespeople treat these folks? They're you know and let's be realistic. You're not going to get harmonization across all those things because they're all driving different outcomes. But if you at least think about it in advance, you can, you can prepare the acquiring or the acquisition, I should say, for some of those, um, uh, I was going to say deltas, but, you know, deltas between those entities, because you might have some stark differences. I, you know, I, I, again, if stories are okay, I mean, yeah, yeah, another absolutely. one, Another one, you know, uh, again, since my background is very technology, you know, based technology organizations, product organizations or services organizations, these will make sense. But, you know, sometimes when you're acquired, you'll uh, you're coming from. So I'm taking the acquisition sort of mindset now. You're you're thinking, oh, we're an end to end business. You know, we have our own marketing team or sales team and you know, my finance team and we have our executive team that does their thing. And, you know, I'm part of the, you know, the, the product or, or service team. And um, when you walk into an acquisition environment, and, and sometimes when you're working with their sales team, you're just another delivery resource. You're not, you know what I mean? They, 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 you could, you could fall into this situation where they don't really care about all the other stuff, all the other ethos that you might have had. It's kind of like, what are you going to do for them on their account today uh, or yesterday, yeah. actually? You know, so with that sense of urgency. And so, I think for the acquiring company you really want to have your eyes wide open too and, and think about, you know, what's that experience going to be like, because it can be jolting at first. And so, you know, going back to something we've talked about already, that communication and acknowledgement of those things, even if you can't solve them, I think sort of takes down the anxiety level uh, that, that your people sometimes feel. What about like stakeholder alignment when you get these friction points where either people don't agree or <laughs> this group's not communicating with this other group because, some of these whatever sentiments that are around do you get involved with that is there a way to help overcome some of those challenges yeah the um i'm trying to think of uh, some some sort of succinct ways to address that because they they do kind of um they have a way of um of perpetuating if you can't stamp them out and i think um you know what what um i have found is is wherever you get those kind of elements um you know, you might get flyby comments and, and, you know, as an executive, you're, you're always faced with, okay, I appreciate that. I want to be in listen mode. Um, I, I have a, a weakness. I want to be more in action mode and I have to kind of guide myself to be in listen mode sometimes more than, than I am. But I think it's important then to, to, to rather than say, oh, you know, we're going to run a fire drill because I heard this one thing today. I'm going to call five people into a meeting and disrupt their day. I think what you have to try to do is be proactive to those things. And, um, and certainly you can't always be proactive. You have to react to the situation. But when I mean proactive, um, you know, it, it's nice if you have the business case and some of the things you're driving towards financial and qualitative, but sometimes you'll have to, you'll have to step back and say, you know what, we have these five or six issues that kind of seem to be cropping up. We might need, you know, I'll call it a set of strategic guideposts and let's get in a room where we're going to stack hands and, um, there's a phrase, I think it's a, a, you know, I'll borrow it, or at least I'll credit it to, to Jeff Bezos and Amazon, where uh, you disagree and commit. I think that's the phrase. Hopefully yeah, yeah, right. right. Yeah. And, and that's a very good phrase uh, to, to bring into this, you know, this concept I'm talking about, where alignment is so important, even if we disagree, we have alignment. 
you know, as opposed to it kind of festering and bouncing around and creating more anxiety. Um, it, you know, I think from a principal standpoint, when you're combining organizations, because you said it, uh, actually cultures are combining, you want to take, you want to reduce anxiety as much as possible. So having that strategic set of guideposts, um, they didn't think you needed, you know, like right this month, we could be operating fines 30 days from now. We've had four or five run-ins on something. Hey, let's get in a room and let's stamp that out and we'll all, you know, stack hands. And um, it might take, you know, a couple of executives above the teams that are having friction to kind of drive that. But I think you have to be ready to do that. I know these strategic guideposts vary company to company. You had some examples. I'm just trying to think if there's other examples of what would be included in that. Yeah, for 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 example, uh, I've been in situations where uh, we've acquired or uh, all about this. I've just been in situations where we've decided to retain a brand much longer than otherwise would have been been thought of, and that's a very uh, that's a very critical one. Uh, as another example might be, you know, um, this entity doesn't have distributed delivery, which means global delivery capabilities. It's just using North American resources today. Well, a strategic guidepost is everybody's going to have that. Oh, okay. Well, that that creates a decision that you know we don't have to make that decision. We know that's the the outcome that's we're driving. To. Okay. So those those are two really good examples because I've run into those multiple times. In fact, the brand one is a very uh, ping pongy one, you know, that sometimes people are kind of like, well, we'll figure it out as we go. And, you know, we have to see if it's, you know, creating more value for us. And, every, you know, people want to preserve flexibility, the acquirers. So they won't want to come in unless it's a direct competitor. You won't want to crush the brand because if it's doing, you know, has equity, you want that to run as long as you can. And it's not always clear when to stop or end. Um, but anyway, the brand one is a volatile one. And, you know, how we're going to deliver methodology, where people are located is usually a pretty big one too. So that's why I picked those examples. Whether you're going to be remote or in the office for the next year. Yeah. Yeah. Things of that nature. Yep. Exactly. You're, you mentioned you're doing a couple of integrations now. Can you tell me about them? Yeah, absolutely. We, um, so at NCIRA, we, uh, we were fortunate to acquire a great ESP email service provider organization uh, out of Atlanta called Brightwave. Um, and we were already doing some of that work within NCIRA. So we acquired that entity and 2019 and had operated together and then fully integrated in August of last year. And so that is, uh, you know, proceeding successfully. Uh, but, you know, every so often we have some things where you have to step back and say, oh, there's a decision point. How do we optimize this decision point? Uh, so that's one. And then a the second one, we acquired a, a really capable, highly capable uh, digital marketing technology element out of CDK Global called CDK Digital Marketing. And we've rebranded that Synchro. And so that integration is happening. Um, and it's mostly done really we have a, a few you know last stages with some back office technology that we're working on but that is uh that is uh the second integration and um you know where we have really come together uh, as a team i'm really proud of this because you know we really had a core which was ansira then we had brightwave then we had this element um cdk digital marketing we stepped back and said you know it's a really good time for us to think about our purpose our, our vision our, our mission and our values and rather than you know us being the acquirer, if you will, figure that out, we created a, a cross-functional team from all of all three you know sort of uh, cohorts, if you will, and we defined that. So it created some um, you know muscle fiber that really you know helped glue us together. And just doing that isn't the only thing that you need to do, but it was certainly really really important because we learned more about each other through that process too, which I think is really important. Can you walk me through that? Uh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. I'm not sure where to, to enter on that. Yeah. So basically, you know, when you're going through the, uh, you know, the definition of of the, the the purpose, the vision, and the mission, that requires you to kind of do some soul searching. You know, like what are you all about, and what are your points of differentiation, and how do we want to represent that so it's compelling for uh, you know customers when we talk about it, so it's compelling for our employees. So without kind of, you know, uh, reciting those things, uh, I know some of it by memory, some of it I'd have to refer to a PowerPoint, but it really created, um, you know, we went through some workshops together and we agreed wow. and we disagreed on certain things. And then, you know, created a core team that then went back to, um, you know, other uh, teams for input in those three different cohorts that I mentioned. Um, and then we came back together and, you know, agreed on what those things should be. And now we use those, especially I'll, I'll, here's where it probably uh, is put into practice the most. Um, we have uh, uh, quarterly all hands and we recognize our employees around how they demonstrate those values. How are they living those values? 
And so that's a really, you know, unique thing because now we can look at across the company and it's, it's us applying those values in a consistent way, but yet unique and different in each, each situation. So it's, it, it becomes actually really enjoyable. You know, employee recognition is a great thing to do anyway, but it creates a framework instead of having three different frameworks and going, Hmm, why did we do it three different ways? You know, that's kind of, you know, not value add. So and you're working together with the target entity on that. Yeah. Yeah. I, of course. Yeah. That, that was a point when I said three different uh, cores there, we're all working together on that. And now, you know, it, it wasn't just a, I think what's really important with something like that, it's not just a, a team that came together and produced an output. And, you know, that's a nice PowerPoint that we showed once the idea of, of, of resurfacing the values and kind of stepping back and thinking about those, because those are really part of our ethos now at NCR. Yeah. And so, you know, as we, as we propagate that, as we talk about that, as we uh, recognize our employees for uh, living those values and exemplifying those values, um, you know, just kind of cements that even further because it becomes something we're all a part of, not something they joined or something that was imposed on some, you know, entity or something like that. And we had the luxury of doing that. I've been part of larger organizations where the phrase I would use, Kisan, is um, you're grafted in. And it's because it's, uh, you know, metaphors, I, I, you know, sometimes I get them wrong. Sometimes I I think I nailed them, you know, I don't know, that's a subjective uh, sort of opinion, but, um, you know, sometimes, uh, you, you know, grafted is a, is a graceful way of saying it, steamroller is another way of saying it, but, you know, I've been part of a really large, you know, when I talk about companies like Adobe or Accenture, just, just really large global organizations, they have that stuff well oiled and they're really, really good at it. Huh. And, you know, a small entity is probably not going to come in and, and reestablish the values of, of a large organization like that. They're going to sort of assimilate those things and, and figure out, you know, how do they make them their own? But it's a, it's a different situation when you have different sizes coming together. What time frame or where in the deal life cycle do you do that workshop exercise? Well, in this, um, in this particular example, very unique, uh, this was after the deal. So the deal was consummated and um, absolutely, uh, you know, probably, the later stages in this particular example, the later stages of integration, uh, in fact. And I think that was just specific to, to what we were doing. We were recognizing that both of these uh, both of these entities have a really big part to play in the future of our organization. So let's pull them in. Uh, let's get them at the table. It's going to uh, serve us all well to deliver upon that business case. Um, but, uh, you know, if, for example, the reason I'm, I'm saying it was a very bespoke and unique situation if we're fortunate to make another acquisition, I don't think we're going to kind of crack open the, the editing board and say, all right, this is up for debate again. You know, let's talk about it. Um, we'll have to, you know, kind of look at, is that an inflection point in our company? You know, I think, and, and what would trigger that? We're about 1,700 people, 1,700 people globally. I'm just throwing a what if. If we were to acquire something that was 2,000 people or 1,500 and had a unique perspective or something that was uh, wildly different than what we were doing, you know, those are those are moments I'd probably step back and say, hey, we should reexamine some things. If we require a 25 person firm. You're probably going to graft in, you know, and sort of right. you know, assimilate in uh, in a different way. And those aren't black and white, you know, kind of thresholds, but they're they were extreme on purpose so that, you know, it seems very clear what we would do. And then that might shift when you would actually do that. Yeah, yeah, it, it could. It could absolutely shift. It could absolutely shift. Yeah. If you do another acquisition, what would you do different? Like what are the recent recent lesson learned? Um, if I did another acquisition, geez, I'm just trying to figure out because that that implies like something didn't go well, and and Kisan, everything's always going well. <laughs> <laughs> just, we learned um, something from every deal. That's the one thing I learned. And, yeah, uh, no, no, for sure. If um, yeah, gosh, I I, I think you this know, is your moment that, to be vulnerable right here. <laughs> yeah, no, 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 that's okay. I I, I think what I would. If I could, and it sounds a little bit like retread because we've talked about this before, I would I would do the integration faster. Um, and and you know I've always felt like there's a uh, set of moments where we're talking about um, what might be or what should be for too long, as opposed to just getting on with it. Because um, the sooner you know, let me be very clear: the sooner you do that, you're talking about your product or your client or your service, and not talking about should we have half days on Friday or should we have full days on Friday? I mean, super important stuff, but I would garner to say your clients and your product and your service 
is probably more important uh, in terms of the viability of your business. And that, that, you know, that's a dangerous thing, maybe the way I said that, but the other things are very important to your culture and the ethos. So you, you want to get them right. But I think, you know, you could debate them too long, you know, and I think um, it's moving forward and fast on, on those kinds of things. And because um, even if you make a decision and I just pick neither one of the entities had the half day Friday thing. So I just picked something, you know, I've run into before. But even if you pick the wrong one, you can, there's no, you know, you can two months later, you can say, you know what, we've reconsidered, we've had some new information come to light or whatever the situation may be and say, no, we really think that's a good practice. We're going to do that. Okay, great. You didn't abate it for six months. You made a decision and you re, you change course if you if you need it, but move on is kind of the thing I would say. That's what I would do fast. I, I just like to move fast. It would be okay. the thing. So stay prioritized and push fast. Yeah, yeah. Communication. I know we talked about some of this stuff, but important points around communication when doing these deals. You know, a couple of things I think are important. Um, I think it's important. Uh, I've been in situations on, on, uh, on fortunate to be on both sides where uh, of the uh, of, of the deal structures where uh, you still enable the acquisition to have communications unique to it. Meaning, you know, like, what do I mean? Like as a, as a former leader of a company acquired that was acquired, I was able to have town halls with my team and talk about the health of our business, how the acquisition is going. And I didn't have, um, you know, a whole panel of other people that were from the mothership, so to speak. And, and same thing when I've, when I've acquired entities, we've enabled that. And I think that's important for developing trust. And do you want to do that perpetually? Probably not, depending on your integration phase and what you're trying to do. Um, you know, as you bring a community into a larger community, and I'm using those purpose, those the words purposely, you, you have to be thoughtful about what are you doing to let a community dissolve because it's attaching to a bigger thing or perpetuate if that's your strategy. And I, I just think, you know, having the authenticity of, of the acquisition, being able to communicate to itself um, helps build trust and actually um, creates a stronger bond in many cases. And, and, you know, you have to be thoughtful about that too, because you want to make sure it doesn't you know, evolve to an us them sort of situation, but more of a, Hey, how's everyone doing? We're moving along the path and here's where we're going. Here's what's not going so well. And we're talking through that. We're working through that, but here are our next steps that comes across much differently than, you know, kind of a maybe draconian, like now you must do, you know, or something like that. If a, if an acquirer were to take that approach. So that's something that has stood out for me is, is enabling that. So like talk um, with the target company, not at them. But. Yeah, yeah, and and but but also enable them to talk amongst themselves, and um, not feel like they have, you know, informants dropping in and kind of listening for how they say things and trying to redirect. I mean, over time, you you have to change that, but it all de all depends on the 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 boundaries of the communities that you're trying to foster. I mean, um, do you encourage that then specifically? That hey, and how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, well, I I think it's important. Um, you know, if you step back uh, and you think about change, change at any level, it, it requires communication and requires uh, two-way communication too. It's not just talk at, it's, it's uh, you know, creating forums for people to express opinions and, and um, you know, kind of share their thoughts and views. And I think um, it's important to facilitate that and enable that. And so, you know, maybe, maybe there's an acquisition that's not doing that. I would absolutely ask them to do that if they weren't doing it. But I, the key that I was kind of, keen on is most, most people kind of try to stop it. And I would say, no, let it happen. Um, because people, you're going to develop trust. And I think trust is so important because you reduce that FUD factor when you have trust. Makes a lot of sense. Any other tips around communication? I'd say the other, the other one that stands out is, um, you know, uh, as an acquiring entity, um, you know, pay careful attention to the acquisition and provide, you know, some interpretation of the communications. And, and what do I mean by that? So as a individual that's been a part of really, you know, some large organizations, global organizations that I mentioned, um, you, know, you get a whole bevy of communications and you sort of learn what you have to really pay attention to versus what you can kind of let roll off your back. And um, that guidance, you know, some things are really important and some things you kind of laugh at and some things you don't even acknowledge. And I think providing that perspective to the acquisition is helpful. 
uh, because especially if you're a smaller entity folding into a larger one, um, you may not know. And that creates anxiety in terms of what's important, what's not important, um, you know, relative to that. The other thing that comes to mind too is, you know, uh, having been uh, in this space, you know, the, it, it's a constantly evolving space, the digital space, whether it's technology or uh, marketing flavored um, and product or service, definitely evolving space. And there is, um, there are irreverent factions. And some, sometimes people are looking for that because they're looking for innovation and ideas and ideas come in all shapes and sizes and creativity comes from all places. And so um, you have to, you have to, you know, be comfortable, um, you know, sort of enabling that space for that acquisition to, to still be a little bit of who it is. And I'm just, I'm just thinking back to my experience, a couple of the acquisitions have been maybe, I'm probably saying this gently, a lot more irreverent than, you know, the acquiring company, but that's kind of part of the ethos of what they were acquiring. And I bring it up relative to communications because um, that plays out in, in how that entity communicated amongst itself. And so you have to think about that in that going back to the start of our conversation, if that's one of their ethos, Hey, a Friday email that has some real edgy ways of looking at, you know, what happened this week and client opportunities, you wouldn't want to stamp that out because that's part of their culture and that's how they feel connected. And I just use that as a really, really, uh, you know, kind of specific example that I think is important to consider. Right. I, that's a common thing, the startup culture and, uh, making sure you don't destroy the innovative machine. Yeah. Innovative absolutely. Machine. These are all really good points. And I know you had some good thoughts earlier about the guideposts and sort of making sure that, and is that something that's really transparent that here's something that anybody can access or it's pretty clear, or is it up to leadership to really reference it and how they're making decisions? Yeah, there are sometimes um, I have found that um, it's important to share with the broader team, you know, so they feel like that there's a consideration for those things as opposed to, um, you know, management seem, seeming tone deaf. So sometimes it's important to definitely communicate it. There are other times where it's probably more of an LT, a leadership team um, set of guideposts that sort of um, could sort of be the uh, roadmap for how we interact um, that maybe isn't meant to be distributed because it could be misconstrued. Uh, so there's really kind of two flavors I've found. Hey, so one thought was how do you manage like the governance and the, I guess, authority when it comes to this whole transition period and making that clear and frictionless? Yeah, I think... Um, you know, building on my experience, what you typically want to have is uh, executive sponsor and a core project team, and then, you know, an extended project team that's contributing to that integration uh, process. And an executive sponsor oversees the integration and the acquired entity. So they're, you know, usually um, in some ways the buck stops, the decision stops with that person. Okay. Um, so it's very clear and they're the acquire, they're from the acquiring entity. So um, that kind of that kind of structure works really, really well because they can they're empowered to make decisions. Um, and then the acquisition clearly knows who they roll up to and it's not amorphous. Um, so the, the, that's that's how I'd address that. I think that's really, really important. And it has to be somebody who also um, is well respected at the acquiring entity and, and you know, knows how to work well across different functions because any acquisition is going to touch, you know, it's a horizontal thing. Typically it's going to touch so many parts of the business um, that it's, you know, kind of melding into, if you will. It's really important that you have an executive that has clout and cachet with, um, you know, amongst, amongst its peers, but also with areas of the business, maybe that person doesn't work with. Got it. So make sure there's an executive leader there that things can roll up to. Yeah, absolutely. And be the champion too. Um, they have to be a champion of because there's so many pressures, as I was mentioning before, you know, what, what I've what I've thought about, um, you know, in my past is sometimes you get very overzealous salespeople that are ready to sell that new product, ready to sell that new service that the acquisition brought to the table. And they could, you know, sometimes create rules out in the wild. That's how it happens. And um, you need an executive who the acquiring entity feels like, oh, they have my back. Otherwise, you know you acquired me, I guess I have to do what you said and sort of kind of becomes the, the governing. And that's not a really healthy way to, to operate. 
getting acquired is often a one-time life event for CEO founders, executives. And it's interesting because it's hard to be prepared for that lifetime event. And you sort of put a lot of emphasis on the front end of the deal, getting the terms right. Is there earn out attached to this and all that nuanced stuff? And then the real th- activities comes after the close with integration that we spend most of this interview talking about. What's your advice to CEOs that are going through that first time getting acquired? Uh, and it's, it's interesting because I've, I've talked to people like, yeah, you should just go through it to get the experience so that you got that track record of building and exiting. But I, I'd love to hear from that because I, I don't, there's not a lot of reference points out there for those CEOs that are going through that. Yeah. That is Kisan. I think, I think you're right. I wish I would have had like a, and maybe they're, yeah, it's good to hear that because I, having gone through that in that role, I was, as I mentioned, I was president of an entity and um, uh, most of my executive team uh, moved on after the transaction moment uh, my CEO did. And and so I was, um, I was, the, you know, still, still driving forward with a couple of their fellow executives, but as the president, you know, a lot of decisions just came to me and they were, they were first time decisions. They were atypical. They were, you know, unusual because you knew that was a point in time, not something that's, you know, going to be something we run into a lot. And and that was fun, but also scary and also, you know, challenging and daunting, all the, all those things wrapped up together. And, and I think what, um, what I tried to do, you know, just sort of came to me and maybe I had some advice. I just can't remember who, who provided it either way. It was my operating model was, don't worry, first and foremost, don't worry about myself, you know, because there's fear and uncertainty and doubt all up and down through the organization. Don't worry about myself, worry about the team and, and just worry about that for the first 12 months. You know, make sure that we've landed, you know, kind of plane landing, which is kind of sounds like a quick event versus a 12 month event. But just make sure we're landing in a, in a in a comfortable way with a runway where people can be successful. Like, you know, I use a phrase sometimes, you know, I can open the door for you, but you have to walk through it. So that kind of mindset, like let's set the stage so that our teams can be successful. What they do in this wonderful environment, because usually it, it just provided a bevy of new new opportunities, almost to the point of overwhelming. Let me land the team and be focused on that for the first 12 months. What, what quickly becomes apparent, so that's kind of point one, what quickly should be apparent, I mean, day one, is that you're really no longer needed as as the president or CEO or whatever, you know, uh, even LT, uh, so it's not singular to a person. You're really no longer needed as a governance function over time. And so I think it's important as the individual or individuals that are running an acquisition, they really have to understand, okay, after the first year, I probably need to make sure I'm figuring out what is my career path here because it's not, you know, captain of the ship anymore, whatever the ship is. And so that's um, that that's kind of an interesting thing because you you also spend, you know, a lot of time building something, then putting it up for sale, getting it sold, and then quite frankly, you're taking it apart because you're integrating it in. And that's a you know those two those the first thing you know sounds very selfless like let me be about the people and. Um, you know, that's great. You know, that I think most people would subscribe to that. But the next two things are really, really hard because your ego, if, if you're in that role, you probably have, you know, some level of an ego. I mean, let's be honest. And, and you're very used to calling the shots. Um, and all of a sudden you have to, you have to let go of that to a degree. And then the pride um, of authorship, of, of being the, the, the narrator, being, building the arch- being the architect of that business and watching it be dismantled. Um, not in a negative way. Usually, like I said, a, a really great way for the employees to have even better opportunity. I, I remember for me, there was there was one area of, a, of the business. I'll just keep some of the specifics benign, but we built a really strong c- capability in the creative space, and we were acquired. And a smaller entity was uh, acquired next to us, and um, you know we had to. We were forced with a decision: should we allow our creative team to join them so that they could become an even larger force in this in this organization? Or do we keep it to ourselves? And, you know, for me, it was very important to give our creative team the opportunity to run and be part of something that was going to be even bigger than the stage they were on today. But that required kind of pulling something apart that was really important to us. And um, and I think that's so those are the three things. It's like thinking about the people and how do you land them very, uh, you know, in a in a 
opportunistic, uh, great way. And then two, work yourself out of a job. And then three, dismantle the business that you've built. Those are three kind of inflection points that, uh, or, you know, kind of, um, initiatives you have to work through. Yeah. That's, that takes a lot. That serving, serving leader my, mindset, open-minded, a lot of, uh, good leadership skills to get through that. Yeah. It takes, it takes, um, you know, uh, you have to figure out what your, uh, your relaxation method and your, uh, you know, keep your feet on the ground method of uh, choice, but, but yeah, it does. I mean, you definitely, you know, it's easy. These kind of um, discussions make it sound really, really easy and it's fun to reflect uh, quite frankly, but I do remember a lot of moments where, um, you know, they're probably pretty lonely for those leaders because you're, you're not really sure who you should be vulnerable to. And there's not many people you can, you know, without talking about yourself, which sounds like you're full of yourself, there's not many people you can talk to about what is this like and what guidance might you have. Um, so it, it, it is an interesting, you know, period that you go through. Yeah, work on an integration therapy service. <laughs> yeah, uh, there you go. I, I see a side business starting for you. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll talk later about it. Jay, last <laughs> question. What's the craziest thing you've seen in m and Oh, gosh. I, 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 uh, you gave me a heads up that this question was coming. I, I kind of have two answers. Um, one that's very, you know, kind of like, well, Jay, you can do better than that. So, so I'll, I'll lead with that one and I'll get to the better one. One, one it's not really crazy, but it really, uh, it, it struck me as, um, a surprise in the moment. And, you know, as we were being integrated through one of my, my periods, um, I never would have thought this came up, but one of the biggest snags that we had was, uh, the technology footprint, i.e., laptop that we had deployed to our teams we were a smaller entity was way better than the mothership we were being acquired by. And that became a big flare up of all of a sudden we were taking things away from our people that were so important. And I was thinking, goodness, of all the little challenge points I was going to run into, I didn't think a laptop standard was going to be one of them. And it does sound kind of basic now when I tell you the story, but it came out of nowhere and it came fast and furious and then became an intergalactic, you know, you know, huddle that we had to have. And ultimately we made the right decision, which was, give the people what they need, great technology, get them aligned and, you know, have them build awesome things for our clients. So that was one. The more crazy story is under the, under the auspice of be prepared for anything. And we were making a management change in a uh, acquisition. And um, it was just, you know, we just weren't sure what to expect. This particular acquisition had, um, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, what do I call it? It was bugged, you know, so it had a lot of you know, technology in the office space and it was bugged and we didn't know where things were. And we also didn't know if the management team that we were um, delivering some hard news to was going to take it the right way. So we had to have um, some uh, security escorts uh, with us and be prepared for anything. And I know that sounds really extreme, uh, but maybe some of the information we were getting was, you know, highly volatile. What happened in the end was very anticlimactic, but I remember going into the office thinking, this is not what I signed up for. I had no idea. We had like weeks of planning for this moment and then it ended up being anticlimactic, but it, you know, just kind of step away. You're sort of think about, wow, I would have never thought that, you know, that we might run into a, you know, altercation per se, or it might wow. you know, flare up. Yeah. So it was, it was pretty intense. Uh, and then it ended up not being intense, thankfully, but that, that to me was one of the craziest things that, that I've experienced and I <laughs> hope to not experience that again. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah, totally. Totally insane. And I left a little color out of it on purpose just so you couldn't trace it back to the situation. But anyway. Wow. At all emanating all shapes, size, forms, and situations. Jay, thank you so much for your time and day and sharing your experience. Great. Kisan, thank you very much. It's been my pleasure and uh, you know, great questions as uh, as always. And uh, you know, hope hope it provided some value to you and your listeners. No, thank you, Jay. And here's to the deal. Yeah. All right. Here's to it. <laughs>